discussing the topic of uh, putting corrosion. In the previous class, we discussed uh, the, the fundamental or the basic mechanism of pitting corrosion. We saw that the pitting corrosion essentially occurs in what metals? The metals exhibiting the passivation. That is a, an important uh, criteria. The second criteria is that the pitting corrosion occurs in selective environments actually. You must have a species that should induce putting corrosion. This is the second important factors. The coming to mechanism, we said that uh, the, the pitting corrosion mechanism can be considered as pit initiation, metastable pitting and then a stable pit growth. The understanding of the pitting initiation is not still uh, well understood process. We saw that the factors that cause the pit initiation or we say the applied potentials which will break the passive film. The breakage of the passive film is assisted by the environment like chlorides and all kind of things. And, uh, but then when you, you start initiating that when the film breaks down occurs, it is not guaranteed that wherever the film has broken will lead to ultimate pitting. There will be always uh, damage of the film, the repassivation of the film, they occur in a dynamic manner actually that uh, we call it as a metastable pitting. Of course, there is a damage to the metal. If you observe microscopically, there are sub microscopic, uh, microscopic level pits are occurring, but these pits not necessarily stabilize. This we looked at the stabilization criteria. The stabilization criteria for the pitting is what? Is that the pit has to have its own chemical environment that chemical environment must be an acidic, it must have also rich in the, the damage causing species such as the chlorides. So, whether the pit will be stable or not depend upon how good you may able to stabilize the environment in the, in the, within the pit. Outside the pit, you are going to have a normal chemistry what is taught with actually within the pit, it is an occluded cell. Now, uh, there are dynamic processes, the metal dissolves, it releases cations actually, they go from the pit surface to the pit. From the pit, the metal ions migrate outside the pit, goes outside the mouth of the pit, right. If they stay within the pit, they hydrolyze giving rise to what is called as H plus ions that also leads to the migration of the chloride ions because of maintaining the charge neutrality. H plus means more positive. So, the cation hydrolysis okay, which decides the pH of the environment. So, there are two processes the dissolution process and the migration process. That is why we said the criteria for pit stability is radius multiplied by the I. So, that is the criteria that the pit could be stable or not. Now, uh, of course, uh, we can go in deeper in studying the pitting mechanisms and uh, you know various factors. I think since it is a, a, a first course on corrosion, we will not go into depth uh, on the mechanisms. Now, what we are going to look at today, two aspects, one is the pitting characteristics and the factors that control pitting corrosion of the metals. What are the governing factors? 
the second aspect of that is how do we control the pitting corrosion and how do you evaluate or to test a material for pitting corrosion. With that I think we will be completing the discussion on pitting corrosion of metals. So, let us look at uh, the when do you call a pit you have uneven corrosion occurring on the surface right. In fact, most uniform corrosion that you see are they are uneven you can visually see there are rough surfaces. You see industries when you go uh, you know the, the steel surfaces are covered with the oxides you know ferric oxide ok. Remove it you see surfaces are undulations now people mistake it as pitting corrosion. Now, you should be able to define when you call that surface undulation as the pitting. The one of the criteria is called as a pitting factor. The pitting factor is is given by ok and before I do do this I draw this diagram of corrosion leads to pitting. This is a, a pit you see here right and there is also uniform corrosion occurring on the metal. This is the D average corrosion uniform corrosion you may call it and this is is the depth over which the pit has occurred D. This is the pit depth. Now, the pitting factor is given as D upon D is a pitting factor. So, it should be greater than 1 then you call a pitting if it is not greater than 1 you do not call it as a pitting. The other way of defining the pitting is it should be depth of a pit upon the radius. When I say radius it is a, it's a gross radius you are not going to have a perfect circle right okay. perfect hemispherical you see ok. It should be you know I think some people define it you know it should be greater than 1 some people call it as 2. So, you have a very shallow kind of thing you know then it is not pit. Now, this makes sense right. If the pit radius is very large and the depth of the pit is very small what happens when you connect it to the mechanism. It is not a crevice corrosion, the migration becomes much easier, right? It is, is no more diffusion control and you can subject it to convection, right? If it is so shallow, the metal will just get out of the pit, it will not sustain a pit chemistry, right? So, this is to sustain a pit chemistry. So, that the pit becomes very stable. The people also have been following the pitting kinetics of uh, various metals and some people have come to this kind of relationship. The, uh, the pit depth is related to k t to the cube root that this ok. 
and D means the depth of the pit I and K depends upon what? K depends upon the environment. Please understand this is related to growth rate, huh? it is not related to pit initiation. The pit initiation may take weeks, it may take a month, it may take an year, whatever, but this only talks about the pit growth, it does not talk about pit initiation. What is T here? The T corresponds to the time of exposure. It is necessary to understand the pit is not only one shape, you can have a complex shapes, you can have a different morphology of the pits. Okay. So, it is necessary to, to recognize that actually. So, we see that you know there can be different morphologies of the pit and uh, if you want to know more details you can look at this, uh, this standard ASTM G46, it talks about identification and examination of the pits. It talks about various uh, pit morphologies. I just uh, reproduce some of them here schematically right. And, uh, let us say you will have is called narrow deep pit. you can have elliptical pit. You can also have wide shallow pit. can have pits which are subsurface. You see here, it just is just undercuts, huh? just undercuts, just subsurface pits, it grows like, like a uh, internally it grows like that, you know and uh, there are some let me see if I have some photos yeah. There are some examples of how it goes I suppose you will able to see this, this is a pit here and uh, pit has grown sideways and uh, you know from the bottom the start corroding up and so you see the pits here very fine pits. So, you see a small corrosion and there is a lateral corrosion taking place right and from the bottom it, it just starts you know corroding and ultimately leading to you know leading to this kind of morphologies ok. You see this kind of things uh, could happen um, in, the, in, in the in the in the systems you know. You also see a similar things here. This all corroded and then lifted. Eh? See, this is about to lift here, about to lift, this about to lift here. So, these are the portions, you know. I hope you are able to see this here. So, look at this, ok. And it is corroded from the, from the bottom and moves up and then it just goes away. 
So, you can have a very uh, uh, complicated uh, pit morphologies it can happen ok. You can also have sometimes very strange undercutting something like that you know. Sometimes you know sometimes it follows the microstructures if suppose you have some jazz follows all kind of things ok. Microstructural dependent ok. It just takes the takes the shape of microstructures I think I have shown this um, in in the beginning of the, in the earlier class. Let me just see if I can fish up that slide. Yeah, you can see here right these pits are all taking the morphology of this is a composite silicon carbide composite and so the shape of the composites are taken here. So, it can take all kinds of complex shapes. Um, so, you can have a nice hemispherical pits and you can have complex shape fits depending upon the alloy because alloy is not homogeneous all the time. It can be chemically it could be heterogeneous and so there can be uh, uh, you know uneven type of corrosion morphologies for pits. Now, let us look at the, the factors that control the uh, pitting corrosion because if you understand the factors controlling pitting corrosion then you can able to you know prevent pitting corrosion. Broadly I would like to uh, um, say that there are two two kind of factors one related to the to the to the environment and the second one related more to the metallurgy. Let us look at uh, these factors uh, briefly and let us look at these factors briefly. Let us look at the environment. We have seen the condition is you should passive it, right? Should have aggressive ions. Mostly the halide ions are considered to be aggressive. What are these halide ions? Anybody remember? What are they? They are fluoride, fluorides, bromides, and iodides. When it comes to stainless steels, The most aggressive is chloride, next is the bromide and uh, the fluoride and iodide they are not really that aggressive ok. Now, you know bro I mean you can say uh, kind of broad um, I would say um, I think so I mean broadly speaking I would say ok not really actually uh, one can verify all these parameters. Fluoride see if, if you have a passive film if the passive film has to get damaged by these ions ions have to migrate in the passive films right. They have to migrate and uh, then form a complex all this possible. The migration depends upon what the radius of the and if the radius of ions is too big then migration becomes very difficult. So, if you if you take it that way fluoride 
is ionic radius should be smallest as compared to chloride and bromide and iodide, but even then the fluoride does not cause severe pitting as compared to chloride for two reasons. One the fluoride forms complex and so promote more uniform dissolution. The second reason is the fluoride forms strong hydrated layers. See these ions in water are not very free, they are hydrated. The water molecules you know I mean these ions are enveloped by the water molecules even you take H plus ion they are not free. H plus ions are covered with what? Covered with water molecules. Why? Water is a polar polar molecule it has got a positive charge and negative charge and so they get enveloped. So, when you have a, a, a fluoride it is getting hydrated it is very strongly hydrated then you do not allow the water to come out and free the fluoride ions because to remove the water molecule from the fluoride ions are more difficult because the charge density is more on fluoride as compared to the chloride. So, the two reasons make the fluorides you know less aggressive towards pitting as compared to the chlorides. And uh, iodide is the largest radius. So, it does not pit. does not cause pitting or other actually ok. Now, there is uh, there is a kind of uh, empirical or thumb rule that the pitting tendency is related logarithm logarithmically related to the concentration of the aggressive ions. Something like you can say E pit is equal to E minus A log chloride something you can say that. So, the E pit will will decrease if you increase the chloride ion concentrations the A this factor depends upon the nature of the 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 aggressive ions. So, higher the concentration of chlorides and uh, more susceptible the alloy towards Pitting. It also depends upon the pH. Okay. Lower the pH, more is the pitting. Tendency. It also, you know, what happens now? The it's it's easy for the pit to stabilize an acidic pH, right? You have you have uh, uh, H plus ions in the solution. You also have one more thing that is um, the nature of the cations. Suppose I add cupric ions, I add 
ferric chloride ions for example, ferric ions. So, what do you think will happen repeating? When I add ferric chloride, uh, let us say uh, I have taken stainless steel and immersed in sodium chloride solution and and maybe it has taken 6 months to pit right 304. When I add ferric chloride, what do you think will happen? Will it will the, will the time for pitting will increase or decrease? It will not change at all. Can you remember uh, some time back I gave a very a, an empirical equa you know relationship that E pit is a function of what? Function of chlorides time and uh, of course, the applied potentials right. The pitting tendency I said that is a function of applied potentials, concentration of the species, that time of immersion right. Now, when you add ferric chloride what happens? What do you think will happen? Any idea? What is the nature of ferric chloride? What is why why you have chosen ferric chloride? These oxygen species right the standard potential of of uh, ferric and ferrous ions equilibrium is is quite positive right. So, when you add these ions what happens? What will happen to the uh, corrosion potential of um, of stainless steel in sodium chloride solution. What will happen? It goes up. It goes up right. So, when the potential goes up, so what will happen to tendency of pitting? Increases right. So, when you add this ferric ion, these are oxidizers. So, they promote pitting because they are all oxidizers. On the other hand, suppose I add let us say um, you know sodium chloride or nickel chloride you know they are not really going to change the potential of um, the, the electrode potential of the uh, corroding metal, they may not have very significant effect on pitting corrosion. So, what about the temperatures? What do you think will happen to pitting corrosion? When the temperature increases, so what will happen to pitting corrosion? Diffusion will become positive, what more can happen actually? That is only one aspect of it. What also happened to the dissolution of the metal ion at the, at the pit? Increase, right? So, it is going to increase. So, when you rise the temperature, when the temperature is increased, increased pitting tendency. also increases. In fact, they also um, uh, make some of the salts uh, you know formation and the salts and then it stabilizes the uh, the lower pH and stabilizes the chlorides. So, rise in temperature is always detrimental towards pitting corrosion. Now, some of these ions say chromates, silicates, molybdates ok and even you add even hydroxides, they inhibit pitting corrosion. In fact, uh, you know for aluminum alloys you know to 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 um, improve the pitting tendency they they give conversion coatings you know they give conversion coating with chromates ok. The chromates indeed um, promote resistance against pitting corrosion of aluminum alloys. Let us look at the the metallurgy here we are not going to look at a host of materials you know say titanium undergoes pitting and almost all passive metals will undergo pitting 
ok given the conditions. So, we will just confine mostly towards stainless steels very broadly used actually ok. So, let us look at the the metallurgical aspect of it when I say metallurgy we say the composition one aspect two the microstructure right. You can also talk about the surface nature is not really metallurgy that say that way surface nature. Now, let us take the case of stainless steels and um, discuss these aspects uh, in details uh, because stainless steels are very widely used and they are prone to pitting corrosion. What are the constituents of stainless steel? Anybody? Of course, base alloy is iron, you have nickel, you have chromium, you have molybdenum, sometimes people add nitrogen, they add tungsten, they add um, copper and you know and uh, sometimes they can add manganese kind of stuff ok. Silicon for example, they add actually. So, let us look at how these uh, these alloying elements affect the pitting or uh, pitting or tendency of the metal. Now, the pitting tendency of the metal you could define by some electrochemical parameters right. What are the parameters anybody recollect? What are the parameters that you you can use to measure the relative resistance of an alloy to pitting? What are the parameters? What is there yeah, please what is that? Pitting potential. Pitting? Pitting potential and other one is called as the repassivation potentials. Okay. Now, let us look at this um, how various alloying elements affect this these these two properties. So, schematically this is the forward scan, backward scan right. From the corrosion potential you rise the potential you get what it is called it is called as what do you call this current density? I C I critical current density. Now, what is this called? I passive. And what is this one? E pit. And this is called as E repassivation potentials. Now, let us look at the elements that uh, can affect this. The elements that move up the pit are going to improve the pitting tendency, pitting resistance of the stainless steels. So, what are these elements? These elements are chromium, molybdenum, nitrogen, tungsten, silicon, vanadium, and nickel. So, these elements they increase the pitting potentials. So, when you increase the pitting potential that means, the the initiation tendency of the metal to pit is uh, is uh, is reduced. What about this? If it goes up it is good this is called repassivation potential it is if it goes up these these things you have molybdenum 
nitrogen, tungsten and chromium. Of course, you want to know about the passicon density if it you want this to be reduced or not. The passicon density is reduced uh, these elements chromium, nickel, tungsten and nitrogen to a certain extent. And you want to know about this one. What is this potential called? E primary passive potential, right. What are the factors that affect this? And you see, nickel is, is not good, it, it increases, and so as copper it increases. Which one decreases IC? Now, these elements like chromium, nickel, vanadium, moly and nitrogen. So, in fact, this forms a basis for development of various types of stainless steels, right, which are resistance to corrosion in general right fitting corrosion in particular <coughs> crevice corrosion in particular ok and this this forms the basis of that. Of course, you know you cannot keep adding the way you want you know suppose I take a austenitic stainless steel I want to increase the fitting uh, resistance I cannot keep adding so much of chromium right if you add it what happens the austenitic phase will turn into a ferritic phase ok. So, then you need to make a phase balance. So, you need to add nickel to it right. So, the other development is a different story altogether right, but the corrosion resistance story depends on this diagram ok. And in order to get different phases you compensate with the relevant alloying elements ok. So, that is a different story of physical metallurgy of stainless steels we will not be discussing over here. Now, if you look at here, if you look at here, there is a there is also an empirical equation ok and uh, to to, um, to to correlate alloy chemistry to uh, pitting corrosion that is using P or E n. Is, is the term is, is the um, is an index which is given as percentage of chromium plus 3.3 percent of uh, uh, molybdenum and 0.5 of tungsten plus 16 percent of nitrogen. What is PREN? called as pitting resistant equivalent number. Okay. And you can say that if P R N increases Pitting resistance increases. So, for um, applications uh, involving large amount of chlorides like sea water applications, the stainless steels with the higher PREN are being developed. Some of them, in fact, are in use. Okay. Now, I give some um, some example here. I hope you can able to see this uh, chart here. It is uh, this represents uh, various uh, austenitic grade stainless steels. Uh, you can 
use this kind of things for even Freddy grade also you can do that. What is given here is the P R N number you know starting from let us say 15 right is going up to let us say 60 ok and see the stainless steels have been developed from starting from here up to this right is called as the 654 SMO ok. This is this got a 6 molybdenum you know ok is, is higher amount of molybdenum is present here ok. Now, you cannot add a high amount of molybdenum because it becomes a predict stabilizer. So, people add more amount of nickel to that actually ok. So, this is also you have 254 SMO this 254 SMO ok this and uh, you know 25 chromium you have actually ok. And uh, so, you find that and uh, you know so, the various kinds of stainless steels are being developed in order to have higher repeating resistance which means they do have higher P R N number, but the cost of this also going to go high right. You have more nickel more molybdenum it is really increasing its cost of it. So, that is one of the problems of using austenitic grade stainless steels. So, what happened what happened was that ok there is a variation of this people use what is called as a duplex grade stainless steel it is it is it is somewhere in between you know nickel based alloys and uh, ok nickel based alloys also have very high putting resistance. Now, the cost of uh, the duplex stainless steels with high you know at high P R A number or lower compared to the cost of austenitic stainless steels at high P R A number. The reason is very simple the nickel content in duplex stainless steels are all going to be mostly lower compared to nickel content in the austenitic grade stainless steels. So, again there is a gradual growth of duplex stainless steels with low P R A number it going up to 40, 46 and so on. Now, look at this 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 duplex stainless steel can be used in sea water application where the chloride content is 3.5 8 percent. Similarly, you can also use uh, you know uh, 254 SMO ok sorry 654 SMO you can use that and um, and uh, but then this is prohibitively very expensive this material here compared to the duplex stainless steel here ok. So, what I am trying to say is that the development of stainless steels were based on understanding the chemistry of the alloy towards the pitting corrosion of the metals actually. In all this the nitrogen plays a very very significant role. Uh, let me just see if I can show you some some kind of uh, yeah curves here. Let me show this polarization curve ok and uh, see it is it is essentially is a, it is a 904 L um, filler wire you know you know what is called a cladding right. What is the cladding and uh, you melt and deposit you, you can also deposit without melting also actually right. It is it is it is a layer of uh, of uh, in this case uh, 904 L formed on mild steel here ok. This is done by welding by weld cladding. So, melt it and and apply on the on the mild steels and this is 904 L ok. So, what happens see in this case the the carbon steel why, why people go for cladding because you want to go for higher corrosion resistance materials you want to have a thick one it is very expensive right. So, you can go for a carbon steel or other steel having lower cost go for a thicker component you just deposit a clad layer of let us say 2 or 3 millimeters that takes care of the corrosion and the the, the basic substrate takes care of the strength characteristics. So, it becomes cheaper. Now, we have done some work related to 904 L ok. Look at this here it starts with the this is the 904 L without adding any nitrogen. When you start adding nitrogen further and further you, you see what happens now the pitting the pitting potential increases and even the repassation potential also increases. Now, in this case the nitrogen content is 0.245. So, when you add to the weld more nitrogen what happens the pitting 
resistance increases significantly. Please see here the weight is it is about 0.258 percent only it is not too, too much. So, by adding this nitrogen you can increase pitting resistance from you know E pit value from minus 400 you know it has gone up to 1.2 volt. In fact, 1.2 volt means it is not pitting actually if you look at the pool bed diagram it will be what? It will be oxygen evolution reaction ok. So, essentially this does not pit at all by just addition of small amount of nitrogen. So, a lot of development can be uh, can be done um, to improve the pitting performance um, of, of stainless steels. Because uh, you know pitting corrosion also is very widely studied from the mechanistic point of view. What I mean by that? When you add molybdenum, when you add when you add molybdenum, when you add nitrogen, they are much more effective as compared to chromium actually. So, people have studied why molybdenum is very very um, effective and people have studied why nitrogen is very effective because there is no loss word right. Still there are multiple theories as to why molybdenum improves pitting resistance as to why nitrogen improves uh, pitting resistance. I just summarize a few of that and then move on to the next topic. The molybdenum the role of molybdenum has been um, has been uh, you know first of all they say that you know molybdenum is not found in the film not found in the passive film. It is found in the actively corroding areas so suppose you have a pit in the deep of the pit you can find molybdenum or you are going to keep the uh, you are going to keep the um, metal in the active region and then you observe the surface the surface will have more molybdenum okay but in the passive region the passive film there is no molybdenum at all ok and uh, and so this led to some kind of understanding that the molybdenum uh, you know uh, it says it blocks the active surfaces blocks the active surfaces one one kind of hypothesis really. There is also other hypothesis which, 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 which says that the, the molybdenum ok corrosion rate decreases when H plus concentration increases. It is a very uniqueness of molybdenum actually right. You, you saw before when the pH of the environment de decreases what happens to corrosion rate increases right, but molybdenum has a different characteristics when you increase the acid concentration the corrosion rate of molybdenum decreases this is called as a negative reaction order ok. Suppose you have a molybdenum on the surface and if you, if you, if you increase the acid concentration it is not going to corrode why because molybdenum has a negative reaction order ok negative reaction rate order and so and so this is considered as the other kind of factors. The other people call it as molybdenum is a getter for chlorides. It can complex with the chlorides. Chlorides are the species which which promote corrosion, right? In the pit, you have more chlorides, and the molybdenum forms a complex with the chlorides, and then so what happens? The free chlorides are very less, and so pitting is is decreased. There are also other theories talk about semiconducting theories. The passive film is considered as a semiconductor right, it is like high temperature oxidation right, you have oxide film it is considered as uh, either rich in oxygen or less in oxygen non stoichiometric oxygen there right. Then you have either p type or a n type oxide conductors. So, similarly you can also consider passive film as a semiconductor 
and and what you do when add molybdenum molybdenum has let us say 6 plus you know valence state then what happens it reduces what happens you reduce the cation right. When you are going to add a higher valent uh, ions in the oxide, what will happen to cation concentration? Cation concentration decreases to make the electron neutrality, and so what happens? Then, then what happens? Lowers passive current. And makes it stable. So, there are several kind of you know theories are available. I have just given only a few of them, and there are some more theories I think uh, uh, you know again for this course we do not have to worry too much about uh, the mechanism uh, just an outline of the mechanisms are ok. The nitrogen has a similar role about nitrogen still not clear some people say it forms ammonia that means it neutralizes. But what happens is I, I we have seen that the, the active dissolution is decreasing, active dissolution. Is reduced due to nitrogen in the in the alloy. Now, we also have um, the microstructures, let us go to microstructures. Suppose you have some phases which are selectively corroding like manganese sulfide, it what happens? It lowers pitting resistance. The selectively dissolve attack actually. So, any phase which are prone to corrosion uh, they will uh, promote the corrosion. Similarly, uh, segregation of um, elements promote pitting. Give an example. You weld it. You weld. What happens now? What what does happen to the material when you weld it? The weld fusion zone. What happens? Some of you guys are having metallurgy background, right? When you weld it by let's say fusion welding, okay, thick welding or a MIG welding. You take a stainless steel and weld. What happen, What will happen? If you look at the microstructure, what do you what do you what do you see the difference between the welded fusion zone and in the, the base metal? I am talking fusion zone. You take a nicely rolled wrought stainless steel sheet and you weld it, and the fusion zone, what do you get? What structure is that? No. Have you heard of a cast structure and rod structure? Have you ever heard of? Hmm? What kind of structure you will have in a casting? Suppose you melt and pour it. What structure do you get in a casting? Dendritic structure. Dendritic structures. Eh? You see, they are very simple, right? See, normally all your stainless steel, they are all, you know, they are. I mean, you have a molten liquid, pour it, and then you do. Uh, you know they do hot rolling and then anneal it out they make it chemically homogeneous. But when you weld it you are going to have elements which are segregation of course, uh, you know, we do not have time to discuss those issues ok. The welds are you will have chemical segregations like you may have segregation of chromium, molybdenum and things like that. So, you have 
some place which is enriched with the chromium, some place it is depleted with the chromium, what will happen to pitting resistance? The pitting resistance will fall because the some regions are poor in chromium content, moly content. In fact, if you look at some of the literature it published, you see, if you see the, the percentage of molybdenum versus the uh, critical pitting temperature, ok, and you see that uh, normally critical pitting temperature goes like that, it is the rod and it is welded, what happens? I will tell you later what is critical pitting temperature. So, the microstructures play a role because microstructure leads to different chemical variations and so, uh, there are uh, issues of, um, of uh, you know rendering these uh, alloys uh, you know susceptible to corrosion. The, the other example is uh, let us say I just give small example aluminum alloys. That is a very nice system to, to discuss and uh, you know how the pitting resistance of the aluminum alloys really change. You know the aluminum unlike stainless steel will have multiple phases to, to have the strength right. In aluminum alloys alloying elements in solid state that is accepting magnesium and zinc increase a pit. So, they are generally good, but then you do not have uh, you know you do not make aluminum alloys generally you know the elements in the solid solution. You always want to have precipitates to improve the increase the strength performance actually, but from from scientific point of view you can add so many elements like molybdenum, ben, tungsten, chromium and host of elements if you can put them in the solid solution and uh, you will find that is a very significant improvement in the pitting resistance of these alloys actually ok. Let us look at the other one metallurgy cold working. Generally cold working and uh, cold work what happens lowers resistance. Why it introduces dislocations and so there will be more corrosion. Surface roughness ok, smooth surface favors better passivity. Hence, rough surface is prone to fitting. So, you make the surface you know uh, you know if you do electro polishing you know make it mirror like you have excellent resistance to fitting at all actually. The one of the factors external factor like you know is not related to metallurgy external factor like velocity of the environment. So, what do you think will happen to pitting corrosion? You have a stagnant condition, you have flow condition, what will happen to pitting corrosion? Pitting resistance will 
increase ok. So, it will increase why does it increase because it will destabilize the pit chemistry right it destabilizes the pit chemistry. is destabilized hence increases pitting resistance. So, we have seen uh, you know uh, overall the the factors that are controlling the pitting corrosion then it must be easy for you to uh, suggest methods to prevent pitting corrosion. How do I avoid pitting corrosion? quickly yeah. So, you can choose an alloy choose a right alloy or what you can do you can yeah you can change the surface state. to some extent it is not going to be ok for long run, but yes it is is good. Third environment change where possible if you are going to apply a material for sea water application obviously you have to choose the right alloy right. You cannot really uh, do much about it right, but if you are talking about a cooling water system or you know a boiler water systems you can change the environment right. You can lower chlorides you can do that add additives the temperatures then what happen velocity that means avoid stagnancy right. If you are going to talk about sea water application you know you know the very robust alloy system is what titanium right. Titanium forms a very strong uh, passive film and so it is more resistance to pretty corrosion you have of course, tantalum ok the ultimate uh, in terms of corrosion resistance and pitting resistance ok ok. So, let us go to the last topic of this which is um, testing and evaluation ok. There are uh, ASTM standards for that ok. You can look at the ASTM standards in um, ASTM U 48 and this talks about the 6 per 8 percent ferric chloride solution it determines the critical pitting temperatures ok. Critical pitting temperature is determined. What you do in this case is that um, uh, you immerse it for about 72 hours maintain the temperature plus or minus 2 degree accurate find out the highest temperature below which no pitting occurs. The highest temperature below which no pitting occurs so, that is called critical pitting temperatures.
pitting is not formed. Second one is um, is also we have um, ASTM G61. It is uh, cyclic polarization. Okay. What you do here? You determine a pit. You determine the E repassivation potentials essentially, right? See, I am not going to give you all these details. You can read this in the in the standard is available in the library. Okay, I will tell you what is important here. What is the scan rate? Higher the scan rate, uh, you get higher the EPIT values. Because, okay, so you have to maintain the scan rate as stated in the standard. 0.6 volt per hour. Well, there are some problems you normally encounter if you do 0.6 volt per hour sometimes you will get a crevice attack in the, in the samples you know sample sometimes you mount it now you have a mount here you keep the sample you know this is a sample and you may get a crevice attack you must ensure that there is no crevice attack taking place. If there is a crevice attack then E pit will be lower than the actual value why? before the pit occurs the attack takes place along the interface here. So, mounting the sample properly ensuring that there no attack occurs with the interface between the sample and the uh, mount is, is a very important thing. In our lab we, we apply a small bead of, um, of uh, epoxy resin and so that uh, the interface is, is protected from that. There are also you know special electrochemical cells available. I think we will not discuss here, you can you can see them in the literature actually. What is more important is that this reversible current what you talk about here is 5 milli amperes per centimeter square. Now, if this is not maintained the reversible um, see for example, if I if I if I just scan like that and I just reverse it here you get like this. If I on the other hand, if I reduce this current even more, I get like this. So, this this repassivation potential E E R P E P whatever you, you write here E R P depends not just on the material, it depends upon at what current density you are reversing the scan, right. I hope you under you will able to understand why does it takes place. If you apply more current, the pit becomes deeper it becomes difficult to repassivate. If the current is lower, the pit is shallow, it is easy to repassivate. So, the repassivation of the pit does not depend only on the metal, but also depends upon the depth of the pit. So, but what they have found here is if you are going to apply 5 milli amperes and above, it is not going to depend upon this current. So, in fact, uh, you know it was done work was done in uh, Southwest <coughs> Research Institute by um, Narasi Sridhar and, and group where they have shown that if you have a critical pit depth beyond which it is not going to it is not going to affect the repassivation potential. So, that means you need to follow this standard meticulously without which you may get a different EP, ERP value which is not an indication of the, the pitting. Um, growth resistance uh, tendency of the metal actually. Please look at this is talks about pitting initiation and this talks about the pitting repassivation here. Now, look at this this is called a hysteresis now right when you when you, when you do this I think we discussed earlier in the earlier class did we discuss this one or not? Did we discuss this one? No ok. So, then I spend a, a, a minute on this to discuss what 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 it is. So, that you will understand it better. See the here you can say the pit has initiated. Now, 
when you advance the potential more and more what happens here new pits initiate old pits grow isn't it so here the, the, the it, become, it becomes a stable pit here right so beyond this what happens you know uh, the pit that is formed here is uh, is stable but when you start increasing the current further which means you are going to increase the potential also now what happens the new pits are going to form the old pits grow now what is happening now when you reverse this current here please see this it is not following the same uh, same path rather what happens now the current the reverse current is higher than the forward current right what does why does it happen it happens because when you have a pit is formed here this pit is not repassivated the pit continues to corrode even though you are bringing the potential below the pit the pit continues to grow because the pit is now seeing a higher chloride ions it is seeing a higher amount of h plus ions and the film is totally damaged it is not healing at all so when you bring down the potential from here to this so what is happening now the driving force is now the driving force is decreasing the over voltage for the metal to dissolve is decreasing here so now what happens the dissolution current is decreasing it keep decreasing here at this particular point of time we can say the pit is pitting um stopped the walls become passive now okay so that's what really happens now so that is why this is called as a repassivation potential now okay so we we'll look at the two types of uh, testing for pitting one is uh, astm uh, g48 wherein you use uh, ferric chloride and determine the critical pitting temperature and also um, we also use that particular test to uh, quantify the pitting on the scales if you go through this standard the standard gives you a lot of uh, view graphs to, to quantify the scales based on the number or based on the depth based on the radius of that we also look at the electrochemical test where we use uh, cyclic polarization to determine the pitting potential and the repassivation potentials these two are uh, the important criteria in ranking uh, stainless steel or any material against pitting corrosion in a given environment please again notice that the e pit or e repassivation potential also depends upon the environment is not just only depend upon the material so uh, these two uh, techniques uh, are uh, you know very widely used obviously you can't use weight loss measurements to determine the pitting because the apparent weight loss is so insignificant it doesn't give you um, any meaningful information about the uh, pitting tendency of any alloys the other important uh, character of pitting corrosion is it is stochastic okay you know what is mean by stochastic it is more probabilistic in nature so that uh, makes some kind of constraint in extrapolating any of the experimental data so this aspect we will discuss now okay now if you expose a stainless steel 
or aluminum alloy or any of the alloys which are prone to pitting to a, a given environment for a given time. And then you observe the, the pits that are formed on the surface. You look at the size distribution, you look at the numbers right, the two, two types of uh, quantification that you can make right. So, you can look at the number of pits in a given size and see how it varies. You would probably get something like this. The number of pits against the size of the pits. You see a kind of armor distribution, something like this you will see. What does really indicate? If you count the number of pits on the lower size and at the highest size, both sides are very small in number right. The average size of pits are large in number ok. But if you talk about a component failure right, what does it depend upon? Suppose you have a pipeline and uh, it, it has suffered pitting and the leak occurs. The first leak that occurs, does it depend upon the number of pits? What happens? What does it depend upon? It depends upon the deepest pit. So, in practice, this is what is going to count for us, ok. This is what is going to affect life of a component. This looks little more, even more simple, right. Let us look at the size effect of of the specimen tested. Does it really play a role? Now, in order to look at it, we take this as a probability concept here ok. The probability of occurrence of one size of the pit ok. For example, what is the probability of this pit occurring? What is the probability? Right. We can also look at the probability of this one right. So, I can determine what are the probabilities of occurrence of a given size of the pit? I can do that, right. If I can expose the samples of various sizes and determine the probability of occurrence of any of these size pits, I assume let us say this is the, the, the size of the pit, let us say it is about uh, this assume that this is the size of the pit let us say about let us say d is the size of the pit let us say 2 d is the size of the pit and 3 d is the size of the pit right. I have given approximately ok. And if I plot the probability against specimen size. probability of occurrence of the pits ok. Let us say, say 0 and you say 1 probability right. And I for simplicity I also read the size in terms of uh, 
unit unit sizes let us say the size of the uh, specimen is 1 unit unit area, the 2 unit area, 3 and 4 like that I can have right unit 1 this this is the 2, 3 and maybe you can say 4 or whatever kind of thing ok after let us go up to 3 only. So, what do you mean by that? Suppose I take this is uh, 1 centi 1 centimeter square, this is 2 centimeter square, 3 centimeter square right. Let me look at the probability of finding the feet of diameter d let us here. Be very interesting that the probability of finding the pit d the sample 1 something like that goes like that. So, the size of this pit the probability of finding that size of the pit increases when the size of the sample increases. Now, you can also you can also find out similar thing for the the pit size of 2 d. So, what do you understand from this particular uh, plots? If the size is increasing the probability of finding deeper pits is more. More. So, that means, the structure is more in reality if you are going to go for larger structures the probability of pitting is going to be larger. The smaller structure the probability of pitting becomes less. So, it is a stochastic process. So, in a laboratory suppose you take a very small size of the sample and somebody takes a larger size sample it is possible that you may get different results not necessarily you get the same kind of results actually. So, this makes the things more complicated. There are several reasons one can attribute to that. Suppose, I take a stainless steel ok. The stainless steel consists of what consists of inclusions right. The probability of finding an inclusion which affects the pitting is more than the size of the pit when, when size of the sample is larger. So, this is one aspect of uh, thing then people have in fact dealt with this um, the the probabilistic theory of pitting corrosion uh, you know uh, has been um, one of the important topic of uh, research. Uh, we will not go more detail into it I just the idea is to expose to you the complexities involved in determining the pitting tendency of any samples. So, that is why when you do test especially corrosion test you give all information size of the sample environment the duration temperatures these are all there are several factors that affect the uh, corrosion behavior of the metal. In this case the size becomes even more important and relevant for us to to consider actually. So, that is something you should you should look at it. So, And uh, one thing I, I just uh, you know um, forgot to mention about the uh, about the uh, prevention of pitting corrosion. I think uh, if you can go back to this slide, uh, sometime back we discussed actually. Okay, I please recall this discussion. I just want add right. We said that the pitting corrosion can be prevented by of course, choosing a right alloy of course, that is a very very generic way of talking about it ok. And uh, it also can you need to look at the surface state of the material how polished or 
the environmental changes chloride uh, should be reduced. Uh, you can add additives, you can lower the temperatures and you avoid stagnancy and all. But of course, the material selection depends upon what depends upon a given environment right. You know the temperature, you know the chlorides, you know the pH conditions and so you decide what can be the alloy that is suitable for that. And for that uh, you also have tests like critical pitting temperatures, uh, EPT values. Please again notice these are all ranking of the materials. I do not think that these tests are going to give you any kind of life that you can supposedly uh, you know uh, you can predict uh, that is simply not possible so far about the pitting corrosion or the metals. Coming back to this the first uh, first uh, aspect that is the choice of uh, alloy and in it comes to stainless steels you know that right you know that you want to increase the pitting resistance the one way to look at is the composition which is pitting resistance equivalent number if it goes high then I think the pitting resistance increases. But the other way of looking at is is you choose an alloy which is not passivating. For example, carbon steel is better than stainless steels. for seawater applications right. That is why ship oil is made up of what made up of carbon steels right not the stainless steel. But what is the problem with the carbon steels uniform corrosion rate is more right the uniform corrosion rate is more than that of the stainless steels. But you if you have the problem uh, about the uniform corrosion, then you go for copper based alloys. What are the alloys that you, 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 you can think of? You can think of brass, you can think of copper nickel alloys, right? They are all used in seawater applications, they have reasonably good. Uh, uniform corrosion resistance compared to carbon steels and their own pit and so they are in fact widely used for seawater application. The other way of looking at it is you have a very strong passivating metals and alloys very strong passivating that is we saw PRA number. Similarly, you know you can look at titanium, zirconium these are all can be used. Titanium is used actually okay for seawater application with strong oxide films are formed and ambient temperatures slightly elevated temperatures titanium can be very well used. So, so to, to summarize uh, pitting corrosion the pitting corrosion occurs predominantly in the passive metals right only the, the pitting I put it as passive system you know I know there are metals like uh, titanium stainless steels and you know alloys which are, you know uh, titanium they are all passive in a, in a very you know wide variety of environments right. But we also know that you can also passivate many metals right uh, depending upon the environment you make it pH uh, you know slightly favorable right? even steel can can do magnesium can undergo passivations. And in such cases uh, they can undergo pitting ok. So, it is the passive system it also depends upon the environment. specific uh, anions I specially put it of course cations also can influence right 
can cations influence pitting corrosion? Yeah. Cation accumulation. Of course, that is that is another part of it. I am talking about the environment. I am not talking about the cations dissolved in the pit and causing the pH change. Okay. I am talking about external addition of cations. If they are oxidizing agents. Yeah, oxidizing agents, right? Your ferric ions, cupric ions, mercury chloride, you know, all the highly oxidizing environments can can cause pitting environment, of course. But then anions are very important, ok. We talked about the pitting mechanisms. We looked at especially what initiation, then we talked about metastable pitting. Then we talk about table pitting, right. The initiation is governed by what? Film breakdown, am I right? Film start breaking down because of the, the anions present in the environment. Initiation mechanisms still are not, you know, well defined, uh, still not 100 percent clarity is there. We, I have uh, looked at the metastable pitting, right. When the film breakdown takes place, uh, there is a localized damage, uh, micron or submicron levels, and uh, how do you know it is uh, metal undergoes metastable pitting? If you look at the current oscillations, if you are going to apply a potential in the passive region over the sample and you monitor the current, the current there is no stable current, there is always a fluctuation in the current, right. And as you move the potential towards the pitting potentials, the fluctuation increases. These fluctuations indicate that there is a breakdown of the film and then there is again healing of the surface by reforming the film. And the criteria of a metastable pitting turning into a stable pitting, right. What is the criteria for this? When does it become stable? Yeah. When does it become a stable pit? Pit chemistry. Yeah, it is a pit chemistry, right? It is a pit chemistry. The pit chemistry is special, right? It has got more H plus, it has got more chloride. So, it does not allow the metal to repassivate. So, that is governed by what? Salt film, diffusion effects. We also had a criteria called as R I criteria we talked about, right. It also depends upon the potential drop. Drop between what? Between the pit, the pit and the pit mouth. Because there is a potential drop, it does not allow the pit, the growing pit that front does not allow to repassivate, right. They are kept at a very more negative potentials, the dissolution occurs. We talked about the mechanisms. Then we talked about the factors controlling the pitting corrosion, right. This is environment, and electrochemistry,
metallurgy, right? We look at the temperatures, look at the pH, we look at the velocity effect, for example. Okay. We have a very greater influence on that. Radiochemistry means what? It is the potential, right? If you are going to move the specimen towards hitting potential, it is going to break. Film is going to break and you are going to have uh, you are going to have a higher damage with passive films. We also look at the metallurgy in terms mostly we have seen in relation to stainless steels, right? And how the various alloying elements affect the, the, the two parameters pitting potential and the repassivation potentials, right? We saw that various alloying elements, right? Microstructures. They do significantly affect pitting corrosion. When I say microstructures, it could be all kind of things. It can be segregation of various phases, and we talked about cold work. Right. I, I forgot to summarize, right? And we also defined what is a pit, right? A pitting factor. It's just not that an uneven corrosion is can be defined as a pitting, right? The radius of the pit to the depth of the pit is very important. You should have, you know, the the radius should be smaller compared to the depth of the pit. Then only the pit can be stable. Okay. Then we look look at what? Look at the control measures. Then we look at the test methods. Because you can sum you can add one more to this and metallurgy is the surface state. Okay. Any questions in pitting corrosion so far? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we'll share close the discussion um, on this topic of uh, pitting corrosion.